Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Dr. Matthew Lloyd Collins. Thank each of you, first and foremost, for showing up for your own spiritual evolution and your own growth in this lifetime. It's very important. Give yourselves a round of applause. You guys are here tonight. It is raining outside. Other people are driving, traversing the streets, cursing at each other right now. Having road rage incidents. They're happening right out around us all the time. But you don't have to live that way. You can drive with serenity. You can be liberated in this lifetime. And those are the ideas we're going to discuss tonight. The workshop purpose and promise. Whenever you go to a workshop, make sure you know what the purpose is and make sure they have a promise. There's no purpose, there's no need to be there. If there's no promise, there's nothing you'll take away. So the purpose of this workshop is to introduce you to Earl Nightingale's concept of the strangest secret. It's a very powerful concept. It's hidden in plain sight, but unfortunately it remains a secret to many. And the promise of this workshop is you'll leave with a new set of tools to enhance your own health, your own wealth, and your own happiness. Does that sound good to everyone? Sound like something that's reasonable? 30 minutes of your time, you may learn something. You may not. <laughs> you may know this already. But if you don't, it's going to be very meaningful. So let's move forward. To begin, let's talk about health. What is health? Somebody from the audience. I'll call on someone if I don't hear. So somebody define health for me. What is health? Um, Stand up. What's your name? <laughs> Give us your name. My name is Jamel. Jamel. What is health? Absolutely. You know, I wrote down on this paper, well-being. It says, you're clairvoyant. You're reading my mind or seeing the paper from there. Yes, that was on my mind too, well-being. But it could be physical well-being. We think of our physical health. Having robust physical health is important this lifetime. Spiritual health, often ignored in our society, but just as important. <laughs> Emotional health, you know, ideas that are suppressed, a lot of anger going on right now over should we should build a wall, should we not build a wall? <laughs> yeah, it's amazing to me. How much time gets allocated to such little decisions like that when it's a tiny fraction of the overall budget. <laughs> it's just a talking point. You'll discover that about politicians. They're not really here to solve any problems. They're here to wrestle with problems. They wrestle with problems until the next election. They talk about how they're going to continue wrestling with problems. So at this point in my own personal life, I've decided to stop looking externally for validation, to stop looking externally for answers, to stop looking for experts to tell me how to live. Because Simply put, the guidance we're all receiving, the programming we're receiving, is not serving us well. So I pulled out and decided to go a different route, a route of health, wealth, and happiness based on my own definition of all three. So health, you can see the statistics. Somebody read that top line, don't make me call. Up front, somebody who can see it, front row, right there. The prevalence of obesity was 39.8%. It affected about 93.3 million of U.S. adults in 2015-2016. 2015-2016. It can only have gotten what since then? Worse. Probably worse. Obesity-related conditions include heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, and certain types of cancer that are all some of the leading causes of preventable premature death in the United States. And look at the cost. What number is that in 2008 dollars? Imagine 2019 dollars. If you're looking at 147 billion in 2008, what would the number be today? And many of these ailments and symptoms of malaise that people are walking around suffering with are avoidable, completely avoidable, based on what we're eating. Based on what we're eating. So in each of these categories tonight, we're going to deconstruct a lie. There's a lie that has to do with health. There's another lie that has to do with wealth. And a third lie that has to do with happiness. So the first lie we're going to deconstruct to really get to the bottom of all this is a lie about health. Can anyone guess what is a lie about health in America? What are we programmed to believe that's an absolute lie that comes back to bite us every time? Think about it. What are we programmed to believe? Think of the commercials you see on TV at night. All the pharmaceutical commercials you see coming through. We're all trained to recognize the drugs. We can report to our doctors and say, we need this. <laughs> Think about health. What is the lie of health? The lie of health is that you can eat and think as toxically as you like because there's always going to be a pill to fix it. That is the lie about health, isn't it, in our society? If you get depressed, don't worry. We have something to fix that for you. It's a pill. But you may need a pill to counteract the pill that you take for depression. 
and it keeps snowballing and snowballing and snowballing. So the lie about health that we're deconstructing tonight that I want everyone to clearly see through is that there's a pill to fix everything and if you fall into that trap, you can go down a very, very bad road in this nation. Pharmaceutical sale profits are real and people fall into the trap of believing they need to find the expert. And I'm not saying you shouldn't see medical doctors, you should. But first, clean up your diets. Start eating plant-based foods. Start having a plant-based diet that's largely fruits and vegetables. I call them sunlight foods because they come from God, meaning they're batteries of sunshine. So think of a blueberry. Who likes blueberries or blackberries? Mm. Yeah. Think of a blackberry or a blueberry. That blueberry or blackberry just collects sunlight, doesn't it? And turns into a battery of sunshine. When you put that in your body, it explodes from the inside out. It's sunlight. You're putting light into your body instead of darkness. Now, there is a place for meat, for sure, but not the way we eat it. Think of meat like this. If you're going to eat meat in your diet, your eating plan, it should be the size of, of your palm, and then it should be surrounded by fruits and vegetables. Think of it like that if you continue eating meat. But give plant-based eating a look. And I'm not talking about veganism or vegetarian behavior or political affiliations because... The funny thing about vegans and vegetarians, they turn people off to this way of eating because they're very judgmental people often. How do you know someone is a vegan? Does anybody know this joke? It's a joke. How do you know someone is a vegan? Yeah, how do you know someone's a vegan? They'll tell you. That's the part of the joke. Good job. Yes. <laughs> because they're going to tell you about it. And that's not always the best way to get people to wake up to plant-based eating. Proselytizing only goes so far and unsolicited advice is usually not real welcome. So think about that. I have a saying about it. I call it demonstrate, don't explicate. Demonstrate. Show people what you're going to do and they explain if they ask. Usually make them wait a couple of times. They have to ask you two or three times. Does anybody remember the movie Fight Club? Yes. What do they have to do to get into Fight Club? Where do they have to stand? Outside of what? The door. Remember? They had to knock to be admitted. Sometimes it's better to wait for people to ask you, and then you tell them. Wealth. Wealth is the next area of our lives that we're going to talk about tonight. Everyone likes wealth. How do we define wealth? What do you think? How would you define wealth? What is wealth? So, Stand up. Tell us your name. So my name is Christy. <laughs> um, I would say that it's primarily defined by um, money and yeah. assets. Money and assets. Although there is... The idea that health is wealth as well. Because yes. without much health, you could have all the money in the world. And what is it worth if you can't walk down the stairs and have human interaction and enjoy that? So yes, I think wealth could be defined as an accumulation of money. I tend to think of wealth as something more akin to financial stability with enough revenue coming in that you can self-actualize and achieve the goals that you've set forth in this life as defined by you. So think of wealth as being different for each person. But this lie about wealth comes to mind right now. And I want somebody to tell me, what is the big lie about wealth? We're taught from the time we're inculcated in kindergarten as little kids through the modern day as your adult self. What have we been taught about money? How do we do money? What are they going to say? You blank money. They say that and they're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> well, for a short period of time. Yeah. Just like fear can control people if you're a leader. For a short period of time, fear works. But what is the lie about wealth? The lie is that we make money. We don't make money. What happens with money? How does money come into your life? Is it made? It's earned. It's earned. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yes. The lie is that you make money. There are only a few people in the world who actually make money. and They work at the mint. They physically make the money. <laughs> sheets of it, probably. You know, forklifts carrying these big sheets of, of $100 bills off to be cut up and separated and sent out to the American public. Those people make money who work at the mint. However, the rest of us, we have to earn money by providing a service, a good, or something we do with our time or energy that is valued by others and they provide money for that. We earn it. So that's a big distinction. I try to tell this to my 16 year old son <laughs> and he doesn't see the distinction quite yet but when you do it will change your life forever. You start thinking about how am I earning this living and what else can I do? Do I want to start a side company? Do I have an entrepreneurial bone that's becoming rediscovered in my, in my ribcage here that wants to just come alive and start doing some new things? So think about it. Everyone in this room has tremendous talent. Most of it is not being used, including myself. I'm not using my talent to the maximum, and I'm working on that. I'm still working in that direction. But I think it's something we should all consider. Think of the blessing of having a human body, having a human vessel in this lifetime. We are literally spirit beings walking on the earth. 
let's make the most of this and enjoy this day and make it a little better. So wealth, we know now you don't make money, you have to earn it. Happiness, up front, read that again for us, please. Uh, the U.S. has one of the highest rates of obesity and the highest rate of antidepressant use in the world. Does anybody see that chart up there? What are some of the countries on this chart? Korea. Korea. <laughs> Estonia. Estonia. Germany. Mm. So the number of people per 1,000 who take antidepressants in the United States is 110. In Korea, it's 13. Very, very different, isn't it? Number of people in Spain on antidepressants, 58. They're becoming more Americanized, halfway there. <laughs> but here, look where we are. That's incredible, isn't it? To that slide, because I want you guys to see that and really think about that. People think differently around the globe. And they're not anywhere near as dependent on big pharma as we are in the United States. Because our lie tells us that there's a pill to fix everything. So you're not feeling well today, instead of doing the introspective work, to maybe to get to the root of your problem, through meditation, through yoga, plant-based eating, cleaning up and refining your thinking, there's a pill to fix it. And it's part of the problem in our society today. We need to start children focusing on what real food is and eating real foods and getting some of the toxic programming, including the violent video games out of our school systems and out of our children's hands, because we're just programming violence. And I'm not saying there's not a place for video games, I enjoy them too. But it's the screen addiction issues that seem to be so prevalent now that are quite frightening, aren't they? What year were you born? 57. 57. I was born in 72. I've seen tremendous technological change in my life, and I know you have too. When I was a little boy, so it's about 76, I was four, we had a party line at our house. Does anybody remember a party line? Yes. <laughs> so there were three other homes connected to our phone. So you had to be cautious when you picked up. You couldn't just say anything. People could pick up and listen. Yeah. And those were the days we had to push zero. You actually get an operator and they would plug you through to someone. <laughs> so way. think about it. Technology has changed with, with much rapidity since that time. And think about how human beings ourselves, we're still basically the same types of folks who were here physiologically, maybe even six, eight hundred thousand years ago. But it was a different time back then because people were hunting and gathering for their food and people were much more active. Even during the agrarian stages, people were much more physically active than they are today. Today, we've become very sedentary and it's part of our problem. But let's think about the number of human beings that are even here right now in terms of happiness. How many people were on the earth 200 years ago? Does anybody have an idea? About one billion. One billion people. How many are on the earth 200 years later? We're closing in on eight. How do we multiply eight times in 200 years? And is that sustainable? So you think about what's happening. Really, there are a lot more humans on the planet than there were 200 years ago, eight times as many. And people are basically overwhelmed and they're desensitized and programmed to the max, where I think people are just at a point where many are, are stressed out and breaking. And we see some of those events that are horrible and tragic when, when people hit that point of psychological stress that Nietzsche referred to as nihilism, that idea of just meaninglessness. And I think nihilism is starting to be more pervasive in our society. And it's the opposite of happiness. And it's not the direction we want to go. So as individuals, we must start to attune our own vibrations and raise the way we think. Because that's our only way out. Because the basic truth is this. If you're waiting for the government to save you, if you're waiting for your pastor to save you, or your parents, or your spouse, you're going to have a long wait. You have to save your own life, literally. The tools. Remember we talked about tools. You're going to leave with three tools. That must mean we're about halfway done. Let's wake up. Stomp your feet, everyone. Wiggle your toes. This is a good thing. Good thing. The adult attention span is what, about nine or ten minutes? So let's come back together. Rub your hands together. Everybody rub your hands together. I want you to clap your hands three times. Now cross your thumbs. Cross your thumbs like this. Now, just hold them there for a second. What thumb do you have on top? Um, all right. What thumb do you have on top? Right. right. How about you? Same. Right. Right. Hmm? Left. Right. Left. Left? Mm -hmm. Left. Right. How about you? Yeah, right. Left. Left. Right. Left. Right. Okay. Right. Left. <laughs> nah, mine is on the, the left side on top too. Everybody take a look at your thumbs. I want everybody to look at your thumb knuckles and see them real well. 
Now switch them. Put the opposite one on top. <laughs> and don't move. Just try to sit there with the opposite one on top. Now close your eyes, everyone. Start to push down through the heels of your feet. Push down through your toes, flat on the floor. Flatten out your shoes. Now pay attention to your thumbs with your eyes closed. Does anybody feel things different? Does anything feel different? Carrie, what do you feel that's different? It doesn't feel normal. Natural. It doesn't feel normal or natural, he said. Who else feels anything different? Speak up. Your eyes are closed. Don't be embarrassed. <laughs> Somebody else. Right here, what feels? Feels the same as the other side? No. Slightly what? Different. Different. All right, front row. Can I get a, can I get a triangulation? Usually if three people say they're feeling it, <laughs> I didn't think it might be true. Same with political things. I don't ever just go by one source. If I hear from three sources, I think, yeah, this is legitimate propaganda that's being fed to me, and I accept it. <laughs> what are you feeling? Um, I would say it feels a little heavier, like I notice it more. Heavier, you notice it more. So it's basically what? Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable and different. All right, release your hands, open your eyes. That's what change feels like. Yeah. Think about it. Change is often uncomfortable, is it not? If it was comfortable, it probably <laughs> wouldn't have the same impact. So sometimes you have to go through a little discomfort in your life to reach much bigger ends. So that first tool we come to tonight is, is your mantra. Has anyone ever heard the term mantra? It's a saying. Mantra. The mantra we're teaching tonight is health, wealth, and happiness. Now what I want you to do is envision a time, which is all day every day for us, where you get a negative thought in your mind. A negative thought. For instance, I was watching TV earlier today, and this commercial came on for a stroke and then this type of medicine, another one of those big farm commercials that I, you would need for a stroke. And I kept thinking in the back of my head, thinking, man, I might need that. And I said, whoa, 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 pump the brakes. I'm not having a stroke. I'm buying into this programming. So think about when you have a negative thought about yourself or a negative idea about anything in your life. And then become cognizant of that idea. The problem with most people is they're not aware of the ideas that are running like an endless cable loop in their minds, just over and over again, the same ideas repeatedly. That's the way human beings are. So they become aware of it and start to bring some silence to the mind. To calm that thinking. So health, wealth, and happiness is a mantra. So it's something you can say inside your mind or if you're in your car, you can say it out loud in your home. But when you start to have a negative thought, replace that thought with that mantra, health, wealth, and happiness. So I'll say it out loud on three. One, two, three. Health, wealth, and happiness. Say it inside your heads three times. Health, wealth, and happiness. Health, wealth, and happiness. Health, wealth, and happiness. Internalize it. Really, all day long, everyone is walking around with what we call the crazy mind, however you want to refer to it, the, the mind of <laughs> the person who is just stressed. Think of it like that, the stressed mind. That's a good way of putting it today because everyone seems so stressed. Start to recognize what I call errant thoughts, limiting thoughts, and replace those thoughts with this mantra, health, wealth, and happiness. Second part, mudra. Has anyone ever heard that word before tonight? A mudra is a hand gesture. It's used in meditative practice. Everybody put your index finger and your thumbs together like this. This is the mudra we're going to teach. We're going to use this in our final meditation tonight. This is your mudra. So often when you're sitting in meditation, you can use this. It helps to ground you down. Sometimes if you're feeling upset, anxious, nervous, emotionally out of balance, just come to this. Come to this mudra. This has a grounding impact. It brings you back to your body. It gets you out of the head that's just spinning. When you start to spin and thinking of how you're going to respond. And you know if you leave a conversation and you start walking around, you start thinking, I should have said this when they said this. You know that you're not in the right spot. Come to your mudra. Come to your mudra. And the last tool I'm going to take a look at is, of course, meditation. And that's me in the Jacksonville City Jail with graduates of my meditation program. I run a meditation program there as a volunteer on, on Sunday nights. And these guys get a lot out of it because it's interesting. They become more liberated in the Jacksonville Jail than they ever could have on the streets of Jacksonville. Think about that for a moment. Why do you think that might be? Anybody. They can channel their anger, they're going to some programs, but they've received the gift of, of discipline in that they don't have the toxins in their systems. Because many folks find themselves with large amounts of alcohol and, and these days, you know, all types of pills and drugs in their systems. 
and they don't make the best decisions sometimes. So when you can get the toxins out of the systems, at least, in a sober state, you can begin to, to reason and say, okay, well, this happened and this happened. But meditation is a great, great tool. Have yes? A clear, have a clear mind to think. Absolutely. Focus. Absolutely. Remember when you're programming a computer, it's garbage in, garbage out, right? So let's think about what we expect from, from young men in our society. And I'm not going to get into the whole war on men situation, but let's just talk a little bit about what we expect. We expect they're going to grow up and be peaceful and do everything we ask them to do and not cause problems in our society. Yet, how are we preparing them? We're feeding them toxic foods from the time they're little boys. <laughs> a lot of programming that's all violent. Really low expectations and uh, a sea of narcotics that are waiting to be sold. If you really think of it, the cards are stacked against people, but this is our school for a reason. This is not easy. You're here as a spiritual being. You're here to learn. And these are challenges. But many of these men become more liberated in jail because they get to know themselves. And many of them have little short sentences. And if they get out and start businesses, it's not even going to be a big deal in their lives. They'll be able to move forward. So to always remember, no matter what happens in your life, and it may not get as bad as it has for them. You can always regroup and you can personally reinvent yourself. You can do whatever you want. Remember that. Because these guys, I've watched them get out and start small businesses and they're just productive members of society. You never even know they were there. Everyone can reinvent themselves in this day and age. You can change. <laughs> Finally, this is the next to last slide. I promised you a 30 minute shorter presentation tonight. The power of your creative consciousness. I want to bring this to your attention because it's very important when you talk about the ideas of controlling your thoughts. There's a Japanese scientist named Dr. Emoto. Is anyone familiar with Dr. Emoto's work? All right, tell us about Dr. Emoto. I don't know much about him, but I believe he published a book on the healing power of water. That's right. That's exactly his work. So Dr. Emoto made a shocking discovery when it comes to water. And go ahead and read this at the bottom for us so we can have a little content. Up to 60% of the human adult body is water, according to H. H. Mitchell, Journal of Biological Chemistry 158, the brain and heart are composed of 73% water, and the lungs are about 83% water. The skin contains 64% water, muscles and kidneys are 79%, and even the bones are watery. Even the bones are watery. Incredible, isn't it? So Dr. Emoto over in Japan, he came up with a series of experiments where he froze water crystals. Now, this one right here, is that a very pretty water crystal or not? Does it look deformed? He wrote the word evil here. This next one's very much out of shape too and deformed. You fool was written here. And this one is, you disgust me. That's what that looks like when it freezes. Down here, thank you. Love and gratitude and harmony. What he found was the power of our intention in his work on water actually has the power to change the structure of, of water molecules. And knowing that you were up to 60% water, wouldn't it make sense to control your own thinking? If you can just write that literally. He wrote down words like, I hate you. Other uh, curse words on glasses and they, they froze them and they froze differently based on the intention that they were placed in the freezer to freeze. Same thing happened with terribly toxic water from all over the world from polluted rivers when they had folks like the Dalai Lama pray over those waters, they started freezing with the beautiful crystals. So there's a power to human intention and you have a co-creative consciousness within you that needs to be realized if you are to be self-realized and to awaken in this lifetime. Finally, here's the homework. If you look down here at the bottom of the sheet that I handed out, you're going to see a URL. This is a video I'd like for each of you to watch. I watch it daily. Earl Nightingale presents a video. And it's a stranger's secret. At the end of the stranger's secret video, he gives you a framework for implementing your own manifestation. What do you want to create in your lifetime type of thing? How do you want to create it? Earl Nightingale's 30 day test at the end of the video is good for everybody. You write it down, you check in with yourself for 30 days. And if you actually follow your plan for 30 days, you won't believe how amazing your life can become. Small little changes can make big differences in your lives. Big, big differences. Everybody, Come into your mudra. Remember that? Remember the mudra? Now place your, your feet on the floor for me. I'm going to put our tools into practice. Feet on the floor and close your eyes. What was our third tool? We had the mudra, the mantra. What was the third tool? Does anybody remember? 
Yes, in the back, meditation. So we're going to try a little meditation tonight. This is the interactive part of the workshop. Everybody sit straight, chin up. And think Sunday nights, this is what I'm doing down in the Jacksonville jail. You don't have to go to jail to get this. Come to FSCJ. <laughs> Ah, I'm going to do the same meditation I do down there with those guys with you guys tonight. Short little five minute meditation. I'll have you on the road soon enough. So you're in your mood, you close your eyes, spine straight. Now I want to work on something called pranayama breathing with everyone tonight. Because most people in our society breathe from the top of their chests and they need to be breathing from their bellies. For obvious reasons. Think about any NFL team today. They travel with these beds, these oxygen chamber beds, they put the players in. Why? Because when the players are injured and they sleep in those oxygenated environments, their bodies heal faster. The ancient rishis and others understood that we could do this ourselves through what we call deep, lung pranayama breathing. And that's the technique I'm going to be teaching tonight. To repeat again, deep, lung pranayama breathing. Everybody say that out loud. Deep, lung pranayama breathing. Another thing to Google tonight. So everybody, really start to drive the heels of your feet into the ground right now. Become aware of your feet. And push your toes into the ground. Feel your toes. Perhaps for the first time today, you've been walking around all day. Have you felt your toes yet today? Press them down. Feel them. Now imagine the roots of a big oak tree shooting down from the bottom of each of your feet, crashing down into this concrete floor the second level, down to the first level, and see those roots driving into the earth, pushing through to the center of the earth, really ground down. Start to feel your feet pressing into the floor in such a way that you are rooted. You feel really, really grounded. Now I want you to inhale through your noses for a count of seven. Make it audible so your neighbor can hear you. Exhale for seven. Make it audible, loud, your eyes are closed. Nobody should be embarrassed. You can't hear anybody. How many people are sitting here? Inhale for eight. Exhale for eight, make it loud. Inhale for nine. Hold it at the top, exhale for nine. I'm still exhaling, I don't hear anybody else. <laughs> Inhale for 10. Look at the ceiling. Chin to chest, exhale. <sighs> Biggest inhale for 11. Inhale. Biggest inhale you've taken all day. Chest to the ceiling, chin to the ceiling. Look up. One more step at the top. All right, release. Chin to chest. Now, just breathe in for seven and out for seven. You should notice a clearing. Pay attention to your breath. Breathe in for seven counts and out for seven counts. As thoughts crop up and start to float by, such as, what am I making for dinner? When's this guy going to stop teaching his meditation? <laughs> Let him just float by. Because that's just the, the busy mind. That's the stress mind telling you, oh, you don't have time to be here tonight. You have other things to do that are more important than centering and balancing out your life. <laughs> you need to be running around, acting crazy. Let that go for a few minutes. You live that way every day. Enjoy the peace of sitting collectively with a group of like-minded people who want to learn and advance spiritually in this lifetime. Continue to breathe in for six, and then for seven. Then for eight, and deepen it each time. Taking more oxygen into the system and becoming aware of the belly breath that I've talked about. So really start to focus on pulling the pit of your belly to your spine. Keep your breathing up and begin to feel the energy at the bottom of your feet, little pinpricks, tips of your toes. Feel those pinpricks work their way up into the ankle now. Encompass the whole foot. 
as if there's a beehive on each foot. Start to feel that buzzing, that energy in the feet. Then start to bring that energy up into the ankles and into the shins. Start to feel your shins for the first time today. Bring the energy up into the knees a little higher now. Just feel a vibrational energy all the way from the bottoms of your feet to your knees. Now bring the energy into your thighs and your hamstrings. Relaxing your thighs, relaxing your hamstrings. Good breathing. Keep up the breathing. And feel that energy ascending up. Now feel the energy at the base of the spine. Feel the energy coming up into your abdomen, your chest, now into your shoulders and feel the energy radiating down to the triceps and the biceps, coming down the arms, into the forearms, into the wrists, and into the hands and out the tips of the fingers. Now bring your attention to the base of your neck. Bring that energy up around the back of the head. Imagine a pillar of light shooting from the top of your head all the way to the ether, taking that energy from the tips of your toes all the way through the crown of your head. Now sit back for a few breaths. Just breathe and center yourself. And focus on your own health, your own wealth, and your own happiness using the tools brought to you by this workshop. Everybody bring your hands to heart center. Prayer position right at the heart. Everyone's going to match my intonation, but do it loudly. I want the whole library to hear us up here and say, my goodness, those people have had a wonderful workshop. <laughs> so I'm going to ohm, and everybody, as loudly as you can, match my intonation with that ohm, and we'll seal our meditation with an intention for health, wealth, and happiness for everyone here in the city of Jacksonville and a continued blessing for FSCJ to continue serving this community in such a wonderful way. Everybody breathe in. Loudly. Oh, match my tone. Now bring your thumbs to forehead center. Bow your heads. The light in me sees the light in you. Namaste. Open your eyes. That concludes the workshop. Any questions? How does anyone feel after the meditation? Do you feel more centered in your body? Speak up. Stand up. What's your name? Tell you, say it loudly, Jenny. Dion, how are you feeling? Feel more energetic. Energetic. Yeah, yeah. Centering brings energy and grounding brings energy. Because you're not just Loosely letting it go, you're focusing on the energy on the center line. It's the same principle as Tai Chi or any other type of, of a martial art, really, to be honest with you. How about you? How are you feeling? Uh, Clear-minded. Stand up. What's your name? Patrick. Patrick. Clear-minded, he said. Tell us about it. What, what does clear-minded look like to you? How does it show up? It's not as congested, I guess you could say, in the mind. I like that. But it used to like an like a artery of a road out there tonight <laughs> with all the people driving angry at each other. <laughs> yeah, but with this type of presence, though, you can do this in your car, remember. You can come to peace in your car. You got a little work done. Start thinking of, of what you're going to do in that day instead of being angry while you're driving. Use the time wisely. Someone on this side. Spence, how did it land on you? It 
revitalizing. Stand up. Tell us your name one time. I want to hear you. Okay. My name is Spence, hmm? and it was revitalizing. Revitalizing. Yes. Renewing. Revitalizing. Wonderful. Well, that's the end of the workshop, and I'm going to open up for questions for anyone. And let me have them. If you're just feeling centered and motivated to go on and take this stage of your life on as you awaken spiritually, go forth and be well. God bless.